I'm equally uh, pleased and humbled to be part of this very impressive group, and I'm not going to try to place myself yet on the spectrum of Graham, Tom, and Ronnie. Um, as you know, I've been an engaged participant and close observer and keen learner about China for more than three decades. I have always believed that China's rise was in the interest of the Chinese people, its neighbors, and the world, including, of course, the United States. Like anyone engaged with China over three decades, I have seen and heard on many occasions predictions of China's demise or reasons why China's rise will slow or cease. When I first started teaching at Tsinghua almost 20 years ago, I was reliably told that China's education system was impressive and strong, but it was incapable of producing creative students. That myth was destroyed for me in my first class of teaching. All of us have heard, have also heard many times how the US-China relationship is at an inflection point, implying it can go one of two dramatically different ways. I have always been skeptical of such an idea and I remain so today. Let's take by example, the Trump administration. Remember early in the administration, how the major issue and many thought point of tension was trade. And what happened? Two highly professional, extremely well-led teams, each looking out for their national interests, built a highly effective, productive relationship, which worked unusually well. Even today, amidst many sources of tension in the relationship, the trade channel remains open and effective. How did this happen? It happened the way it, it, uh, such things always happen. The leaders of the exercise, Vice Premier Liu He and Ambassador Lighthizer and Secretary Mnuchin, built a relationship of real trust and mutual respect. Not apparent trust and respect, but real trust and respect. They worked hard to achieve this and they succeeded. And they did so in difficult, challenging circumstances. From that basis of trust and respect, all else followed. I highlight this point, which too often sounds easy and is glossed over to remind us that we should all be working hard to do the same, build trust and, and mutual respect. The Trump administration, I believe, has done the US and the world a good turn by exposing and laying bare, sometimes in unappealing ways, underlying realities that for too long had been allowed to persist through inertia, a bias to the status quo, an understandable desire not to risk rocking the boat. The practical result of this has been to accelerate the inevitable evolution of the US-China relationship. The relationship today, which who some see as in peril, I see it as much more real, honest, and ripe to become constructive, forward-leaning, and mutually beneficial to both countries in the world. Whether my prognosis obtains is up to us, to our leaders, and to our two peoples. President-elect Biden and his foreign policy team can credibly be seen as ideal for taking the current situation, the reality laid bare, and make it working with President Xi and his team, not only a mutually beneficial one, but one that can be so for the balance of this century and beyond. Of course, this is a very tall order. I will read you a passage from a paper that is about to be published in the US, which will give our Chinese audience a clear sense of how China is currently seen by a consensus of elite foreign policy people in the US. So what I'm going to read you are seven points that I, I regard as 
more or less consensus among elite American foreign policy thinkers and doers. They see China's strategic objectives as follows. Number one, to leapfrog the United States as a technological power and thereby displace it as the world's dominant economic power. Number two, to undermine US dominance of the global financial system and the status of the US dollar as the global reserve currency. Number three, to achieve military preponderance sufficient to deter the United States and its allies from intervention in any conflict over Taiwan, the South China Sea, or the East China Sea. Number four, to diminish the credibility of American power and influence sufficiently to cause those states currently inclined to balance against China to instead begin bandwagoning with China. Five, to deepen and sustain China's relationship with its most valuable strategic partner, Russia, in order to head off Western pressure. Six, to consolidate the Belt and Road Initiative into a geopolitical and geoeconomic bloc in support of China's policy ambitions, forming the foundation for a future Sinocentric global order. And seven, using China's growing influence within international institutions to delegitimize and overturn initiatives, standards, and norms perceived as hostile to China's interests, particularly on human rights and international maritime law, while advancing a new hierarchical authoritarian conception of international order under President Xi's deliberately amorphous concept of a, quote, community of common destiny for all mankind. So I read you those seven points just so you understand my own optimistic view is uh, very conscious of what I regard as the reality in the United States right now towards China. And I will not presume to give an, uh, our audience a comparable list of how Chinese consensus would see the US, but one knows it would be more or less the mirror image. So where do we go from here? The trust and mutual respect must begin at the top with President Biden, President-elect Biden and President Xi. This should not be hard. They have spent more time already with one another than any incoming US president has ever spent with a sitting Chinese president. They should meet early in the new American administration in person for a personal reconnecting with no expectations for substantive discussion. They should agree to meet later in the, in the year for an entirely substantive discussion prepared in the meanwhile by their two respective teams. And in between, they should be communicating frequently. This is exactly what President Trump and President Xi did when Trump first came to power and it worked. They should also assign very high level working teams to create a roadmap for all serious issues. And the sequencing of those issues, the responsibility for them, and the time frame during which they'll be addressed. And require that this, these high level teams work face to face, very much following the Luha Lighthizer model. That model works every single time. The sheer existence of such a process will be reassuring and stabilizing to both countries in the world, and it will improve the outcomes. I think the thing that I wanna emphasize that's been alluded to, but not hit on the head, and that is uh, President-elect Biden, been a politician for 48 years, very, very steeped in uh, foreign relations. I already mentioned the fact that he, that he has spent more time with President Xi than any incoming US president ever spent with any Chinese president. Uh, and this is Biden by temperament and disposition and every bone in his body. He is a, he's a unifier. He is a problem solver. He is a lover, not a hater. Um, everything about this person uh, will lead him to want to be a constructive uh, engager partner with any uh, counterparty, but particularly the Chinese. In addition, 
there's a very good chance he'll be a one-term president given his age. Uh, but either way, any US president has got to say in, in the year 2020, without question, the most important uh, geopolitical dynamic for the next century is the US-China one. And if you as a US president wanna make a major contribution to the United States and to the world, the single best thing you can do is to put the US-China relationship into its own category, treat it entirely differently than any other relationship in the world, uh, start, uh, uh, get habits of behavior and processes in place that are commensurate with the challenge, uh, sequence what can and cannot be done. There are obvious things that can be done right now. You know, we talked about, uh, uh, Tom talked about, uh, you know, the four pandemics. If you compare the way the US-China cooperated in the 2008 financial crisis with the way we did not cooperate in the COVID-19 crisis, um, there's no reason for that. There's no reason why that, that, that should be that way. And there's no reason why these two countries can't work very well together on issues which affect the whole world and, and both countries. So to me, and one more thing, the, the foreign policy professionals in the, in the Biden administration are of the highest quality, essentially sort of, I would call them sensible, sensible centrists, uh, very pro process oriented, very deep thinking, long-term thinking. So I think that, uh, and it'll be highly recognizable to the Chinese counterparts. They've known each other for many years. So there's every reason to think that, that if it's done in a professional way, which it will be, and if Biden is the way I describe him, then I think that you, what we'll find is um, in relatively short order, there'll be a constructive engagement uh, acknowledging that the underlying realities are very difficult. So there are no very easy issues here, they're difficult issues. But nevertheless, we have in place exactly the kind of people who can solve those kinds of problems. So uh, I leave that sort of optimistic note as my final comment.